Next on the news. We're all human and everybody deserves a chance. You know, everybody deserves an opportunity. Setting up migrants with the skills needed to succeed in the country. Sentencing a bishop to 26 years, the world reacts as the Nicaraguan government imprisons Bishop Rolando Alvarez. <laughs> Finding reasons to smile, some of the miraculous rescue stories going on after the Turkey-Syria earthquake. Plus, stories of valor. We'll hear courageous stories of Father Vincent Capadano and the efforts for his canonization. I'm Christine Persichetti. Current News starts right now. At least seven people in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and one police officer are hurt tonight after a driver in a U-Haul truck went on a violent rampage. And before we continue, we have to warn you, the video you're about to see may be disturbing to some. Police are still investigating, but they say 62-year-old Wang Soar was behind the wheel. He was yelling, shoot me, I'm not stopping. Soar does have a history of mental illness, but has no prior arrests. He started around 5th Avenue and 75th Street and made his way up the Gowanus Expressway. He then ditched the U-Haul a couple miles away by the entrance to the Hugh Carey Tunnel and made a run for it. But he didn't get far before they caught up with him. No word yet on the charges. Some of those victims are in critical condition and are being treated at Langone Hospital. We have eight people struck. Two are in critical condition. Two are in serious condition and four sustained minor injuries. Seven of those people are civilians. One of them is a police officer who is taking police action during this incident. The commissioner added at the moment there aren't any signs of this being a terrorist attack. It may be just a coincidence, but the attack coincides with the start of the death penalty phase for Saifulu Saipov. That's the Islamic extremist accused of killing eight people in a similar attack in Manhattan on Halloween of 2017. We don't know yet if the two incidents are related. New York State hasn't put a prisoner to death in 60 years, but this terrorism trial is a federal case, so the U.S. government government is looking to end Saipov's life with a lethal injection. Meanwhile in Queens, a group of asylum seekers are being given a chance to start over in the United States. That's thanks to an organization that's taken them in and is teaching them the skills needed to be successful. As Courts News' Jessica Eastope shows us, they're growing together and building a community of faith after harrowing journeys to escape life in their native countries. They see or they speak. The men in this room are starting their lives over, seeking asylum from violence and poverty in the United where? States. Yeah. Where? That's where? 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 Reconnect, That's where? a nonprofit that teaches young men with rough backgrounds everything from how to be on time to how to dice vegetables has taken them in. They come to the Thomas Berry Place in Jamaica Estates four days a week. They get a small stipend, a hot meal every day, and 16 weeks of learning the life skills they'll need to make it in New York City. Reconnect just basically pivoted to, you know, do God's work and help everybody, you know, at the end of the day, no matter what part of the world you're from. We are all human. Efren Hernandez used to be one of those young men. Then Father Jim O'Shea challenged him to turn his life around. The two founded Reconnect 13 years ago and now helping these asylum seekers lo que está pasando, eh? has become part of their mission. We created an opportunity and more than that, really to create a community, you know, to work with them to feel that, that there, there is something that they can look forward to in, into the future. In addition to English, they're learning the language of food. In just a short time in the kitchen, Antonio has become proficient. Antonio left his wife and two children and traveled by foot from Venezuela through Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Mexico to reach the United States. There were no opportunities for me in Venezuela. The armed militia groups were causing havoc. There's no good education system. There was no future for me and my wife and children. Okay, okay. He's hoping to get his working papers and build a life here. His Catholic faith guiding each step. His next court date isn't until 2032. My faith is the way it's always been. I walk side by side with God, holding his hand to get here. He led the way for me and I followed behind. Reconnect and its community is in it for the long run. They know they're setting these asylum seekers up for success in this country. You will see. In Jamaica Estates, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. 
Nicaragua not only hands down a harsh sentencing to a bishop, but is censoring Catholics. The country's government is sending Bishop Rolando Alvarez to jail for 26 years. His charge, treason, which he adamantly denies. The government has a track record of suppressing anyone seen as a threat. Now, not only are bishops around the world speaking out, but also the Pope. Que chungono da Nicaragua mi hanno addolorato non poco e non posso qui non ricordare con preoccupazione il vescovo di Matagalpa, Monsignor Rolando Alvarez, a chi voglio tanto bene. He also asked people to pray for those being deported out of Nicaragua. About 200 political prisoners were released. Almost all of them were sent to the U.S. And as Rafael Romo tells us, they were detained in a wave of repression by the country's government, and now Washington is giving them necessary support. Well, you can imagine being uh, in a cage for a year and eight months. Uh, it's been a very uh, traumatic situation, as you can imagine. Juan Sebastián Chamorro is a free man for the first time in 20 months. I was taken at night uh, without a, a judiciary order. I was just taken by the police. They uh, stormed into my house and they, and they took me. Si están viendo este video, the Nicaraguan political leader is one of 222 former political prisoners, including one American citizen, who were suddenly taken out of jail Wednesday and Thursday and put on a plane bound for the United States. The U.S. government is providing them uh, various types of assistance to uh, adjust and, and, and uh, uh, adjust their situation here in, in Washington. Ninguna negociación. Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega denied his country had negotiated with the United States for the prisoner's release. And Washington was very careful to say that the release was a unilateral decision. The release of these individuals by the government of Nicaragua marks a constructive step towards addressing the human rights abuses in that country. This action opens the door to discussion of other matters of mutual concern. Our legal uh, case is a, is, a, is a blueprint of uh, abuses of the legal system. Uh, from the moment of the capture, we were not uh, given the, uh, the right of uh, defense by our lawyers. We were, I never talked to my lawyer. That was Rafael Romo reporting. Some of the people released priests, seminarians, a deacon, and an organist. To help out, Miami Archbishop Thomas Wenske is offering them long-term housing at St. John Vianney College Seminary. Turning now to Turkey and Syria, the death toll from last week's catastrophic quake skyrocketed over the weekend. More than 36,000 people are now dead after that 7.8 magnitude earthquake. The United Nations Emergency Relief Chief now saying that number is expected to almost double and reach some 56,000. In Turkey, a massive search and rescue operation is in effect with more than 34,000 Turkish personnel being joined by almost 10,000 helpers from 74 countries. Even a week later or past, when most experts would say possible for people to survive, rescue crews are still finding signs of life. <laughs> this man was under the rubble for 167 hours. He hugs the rescue workers, thankful to be found. But he wasn't the only one found under the rubble. This woman was underneath the destruction for some 175 hours, pulled alive by workers from the Istanbul Municipality Fire Department and Turkish miners. They're happening all around the country, story after story of survival, despite all the odds stacked against them, from the old to the young. <laughs> Nurses comfort the girl who they think is three or four years old. She's dehydrated and in shock, but alive. <laughs> this is the moment she was rescued. Her exhausted little body pulled after being under seemingly endless mountains of rubble for a week. She was rushed to the makeshift hospital set up in the parking lot of the actual hospital that was evacuated after the earthquake. When she first arrived as a mother, I felt that she was like my own daughter, this nurse says. Jubilation shared around the country as rescue crews in Turkey continue to find survivors. In this case, an amazing 107 hours after the quake leveled the building. 
This young boy, the only survivor in his family, pulled from their collapsed apartment building. A father waves as he and his entire family are rescued 102 hours after the earthquake. His son cries as he's pulled out. Over and over, renewed hope as more survivors are found. While aid to Syria has been difficult, that country too has had its own miracles. A Syrian baby girl was born beneath the rubble, found still attached to her mother 10 hours after the shock. Thousands offered to adopt the infant after it was learned none of her family survived. But now we are learning she has a home and a name, Aya, which means a sign from God in Arabic. She was adopted by her great uncle who will take her once she is released from the hospital. Back here at home, the U.S. military shot down another unidentified object Sunday on President Biden's order. According to the Pentagon, the craft was flying at 20,000 feet, this time over Michigan's Upper Peninsula, when U.S. fighter jets took it down. They say the octagon-shaped object was not a military threat, but rather a flight hazard. But it's the third one shot over the U.S. in as many days, the fourth in just over a week, and lawmakers want answers. I have real concerns about why the uh, administration is not being more forthcoming with everything that it knows. But part of the problem here is that the, both of the, the second and the third uh, objects were shot down in very remote areas. The Department of Defense says the objects shot down Friday and Saturday didn't resemble the suspected Chinese spy balloon taken down last week. Debris recovery efforts for those downed balloons are ongoing. There's a lot more news headed your way. Celebrating a life. We'll look back at Father Capadano's achievements on what would have been his 94th birthday. A new look for the quarter. A Cuban icon gets immortalized by the U.S. Mint. And the unique way people in Michigan celebrated Mass this weekend. Today, on what would have been his 94th birthday, we celebrate the life of Mary Knoll father, Vincent Capadano. He's known to most as the Grunt Padre. The Staten Island native is a hero who lost his life in Vietnam helping wounded Marines. His heroism earned him the highest military award, the Medal of Honor, and efforts to get him canonized. And those efforts are moving forward after they were stalled by theological consultants last summer. A commission is being appointed to address some of their concerns. The first is on Father Capadano's Positio, the formal brief arguing for his canonization. Consultants are concerned that it focuses on the last year of his life and doesn't provide a full picture of the required virtuous life. Second, they're worried about his disobedience because that Mary Noel the Grunt Padre objected to being sent to Hong Kong. They're also concerned that Mary Noel didn't pursue his sainthood cause. It was highlighted that Father Capadano was attentive about his appearance, a possible sign of of sinful pride. And finally, they worry venerating service members may not be appropriate for the church. Joining us now to talk more about Father Capadano and his canonization cause is the new Coast Guard chaplain, Father Daniel Mode, who actually wrote a book about the Grunt Padre. Hi, Father, and congrats on your new role with the Coast Guard. Thank you. It's a great joy to be with you. So you've been involved in Father Capadano's canonization cause. Can you tell us what's the latest with that? So uh, I, I talked to one of the vice postulators, her name is Mary Brees, and she updated me that uh, back in November, uh, Archbishop Brolio, who is the Archbishop of the military, who is presenting the cause to the Catholic for the cause of saints, uh, was able to meet with the prefect of the cause of saints back in November and uh, get some understanding of how to move the cause forward. And as of December, uh, he has begun to assemble a tribunal uh, to review all those questions that were asked of the of the decapitary and to formally uh, answer those questions through uh, a historical commission. Well, that's wonderful news. And we just mentioned how the sainthood cause had been stalled. Everything from him being a member of the military to his neat appearance. What did you think of those reasons for the delay? Well, uh, you know, I always said for the last 34 years that I've uh, known Father Capadano, God's will be done. If God's will is that uh, he be declared a saint, uh, his will will be done. Um, he is a servant of God. He has been an inspiration to me personally, and I know to many, many others. 
Yeah, how has Father Capadano's story ministering to the needs of the Marines fighting in Vietnam directly impacted your ministry? Well, you can see I'm in uniform, uh, and I've been in uniform for uh, 34 years. But the reason why I'm in uniform is because of Father Capadano. Hmm. Knowing about his life, hearing about his life, and ultimately writing my master's thesis about his life that turned into the book, The Grand Padre, obviously influenced me in a great way. And I know you learned about Father Capadano while in Navy Chaplain School on, in Rhode Island. You, you wrote the book about him called The Grunt Padre. How did it all come about? So you, you decided to do your thesis on it because they were like um, things named after him, right, in Rhode Island? Absolutely. So every chaplain goes to uh, the chaplain school in Newport, Rhode Island, which is where the Naval War College is. And a lot of our training schools for officers are there, including our, our chaplain school. And back in the summer, and this goes way back, to 89 uh, when I first started as a very young seminarian uh, and as a chaplain candidate. Uh, the ship in the harbor was the USS Capadano. The street, and it still exists today, uh, Father Capadano Street in front of our main barracks uh, where the Marine uh, drill instructor you know, ran us along. And then the chapel at the time uh, in the, the chaplain school was named after Father Capadano. Wow. All right. Father Daniel Mode, chaplain of the Coast Guard and author of The Grunt Padre. Thanks so much for being here and good luck in your new post. Thank you very much. God bless. You can get a copy of Father Daniel Mode's book, The Grunt Padre, on Amazon. The Diocese of Brooklyn is celebrating the accomplishments of black Catholics during this Black History Month. This mass at the Cathedral of St. Agnes was coordinated by Brooklyn's Vicariate of Black Catholic Concerns and the Diocese of Rockville Center's Office of Multicultural Diversity. Among the highlights of the mass included colorful attire and passionate vocals by the Sister Thea Bowman Choir, named after an African-American nun who is up for sainthood. The Bishop of Brooklyn, Robert Brennan, was the celebrant and highlighted black Catholic history as a rich part of the church's legacy. There are lessons that we need to learn from that legacy. There are some painful reminders um, uh, within that history of, of examples of either racism or neglect. And um, those are things we have to learn from. That said, it's not just about that. It really is celebrating the gifts. It, it, you know, just see, being a mess and, uh, and seeing the church in prayer and in song um, shows the spirituality of the African-American culture. Bishop Brennan also remarked on the great diversity of the Mass, which included multiple nationalities like African and Caribbean Americans. An Afro-Latina icon may not be on her way to sainthood, but she will soon appear in your pocket. Celia Cruz will be getting her own quarter starting in 2024, the first Afro-Latina to do so. The Catholic Cuban-American is one of the most celebrated music artists of the 20th century. Over her decades-long career, the so-called Queen of Salsa earned 23 gold records, plus numerous Grammys, Latin Grammys, and the Presidential National Medal of Arts. Meantime, hundreds of students walked out of class for what they felt was a censorship of black history. The teens at Hillcrest High School in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, were outraged when they found out slavery and civil rights were being left out of the Black History Month program. Megan Scarano reports. I think this walkout stands on how passionate I am about having this Black History Month program. It's, it's everything to me. Jemiah Brown organized the walkout at Hillcrest High, and all of these students supported her. She says the demonstration was in response to what the students in charge of putting on the program were told by an administrator. We were told that we could not talk about slavery in the civil rights movement because one of our administrators felt uncomfortable. But admitting vital parts of history didn't sit well with the students involved with the Black History Month program. My protector from 8 a.m. to 3.15, for you to tell me that I can't talk about something that is dealing with my culture, it's, it's very disturbing, it's very confusing. Why am I being censored about my culture? 
something that is rooted in me. Why can't I talk about it? I reached out to Hillcrest High School for more answers about the direction students were given. I was told to contact the Tuscaloosa County School System. They sent us this statement reading in part. We are putting together a plan to make sure our students feel heard so that we know the right steps to put in place to ensure all students know that they are valued. Hillcrest High School students reached out to their local NAACP chapter for guidance. I don't know how you could talk about black history in this country without talking about slavery or the civil rights movement. As a leader of the NAACP in your community, how does that make you feel? Angry. I'm angry. Um, I've, and part of me feel like we failed our students. Students tell me they were just recently made aware they can now talk about civil rights and slavery in their program at the end of the month, but that doesn't take away the pain the initial direction caused. Without our history, we are nothing. Without teaching our youth where we have come from, we how can we move forward? That was Megan Scarano reporting. The NAACP has reached out to the superintendent to speak about this issue, but a date has not yet been set. The students at St. Luke's School in Whitestone have a new reason to celebrate. After a ribbon cutting and blessing, they now have a brand new indoor recess room. Now, when it's too cold or rainy outside, the kids can still have fun inside. It's filled with games, books, art supplies, and more. It was founded by the parent organization and designed by the president of the Principal and Parent Association. How cool for them. Still to come on Currents News, 102 years young. The fitness instructor that's making sure her friends have a lot more years ahead of them. And people celebrate mass in the coolest chapel around. Mass for some in Michigan looked like a winter wonderland. <laughs> In a yearly tradition, Michigan Tech students who were part of St. Albert the Great University Parish built an ice chapel to celebrate mass. The structure is built out of snow, two by fours and plywood. So many people attended the services that an overflow of people celebrated mass from the outside of the walls. Not only are more and more people helping to build the ice chapel every year, but it's becoming more elaborate in design. Pretty cool. All right, need motivation to take care of yourself? Well, here you go. Our next story is about a 102-year-old workout instructor helping to make sure that her and her friends have plenty of good years left. Michelle Powers has more. Four, five. Jean Bailey is all business as she leads this class. It's a half an hour exercise that does your whole body. Jean doesn't just talk the talk. If you do anything, do it right. At 102 years of age, she walks the walk. I think it's so important to keep your body busy as well as your mind. And it's very important to keep your mind occupied. Four times a week, she coaches her neighbors at an assisted living center in Elkhorn, Nebraska. She's the oldest and the toughest. They say I mean. You're mean. <laughs> oh, no, never. Only teasing. Never, yeah, only teasing. <laughs> Six, seven, don't get ahead of me. Eight, <laughs> nine, <laughs> ten. Sometimes they just fly. Flapping, lifting, lunging forward. Jean says she needs this, too. And she's not done yet. Jean plans to keep coaching as she continues to live her life to the fullest. God lets you stay around like this, and I'm not sure why, so I, there's things I must have to do yet. Michelle Powers, Current News. We could all only hope to be that fit at that age, right? And that is Current News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.